before Professor Brackey comes up, let me echo Peter's appreciation for the Engel family who created this chair in the history department. It's because of them that we are able to attract such high quality faculty to the Ohio State University, and we're very grateful for the legacy of their generosity. I hope all agree that we have hit the proverbial home run in recruiting David to this position, and now it's my distinct pleasure to present Professor David Brockey. Maybe 19 years is as long of bad football. <laughs> um, thanks to all of you for coming. This is great. And to Dean Steinmetz for coming to introduce me. Uh, I'd like to thank the Department of History and the Center for the Study of Religion for organizing this event, especially Peter Hahn, Lindsay Jones, and Tina Sessa, but above all, Christina Ward. Um, it is indeed a great honor to be the Joe Engel Chair. Um, even before this possibility came up, I knew about uh, the great generosity of Joe Engel to not just Ohio State, but to other institutions in this country in the study of Christianity and religion in general. Um, but for one moment, I'd like to think about another Joe, uh, and that is uh, my predecessor in this role, Joe Lynch, um, who I also had the great pleasure to meet once when I came to Ohio State to give a lecture some years ago. Afterwards, sent me this great email full of ideas after I after I spoke. But of course, I knew about his work beforehand. Um, but anyway, here's just a little anecdote about him, or at least about his influence on people. Um, in April 2011, um, I made a visit to another university to give a public lecture. Um, I had just recently been invited to take this chair, and I had not decided whether to come to Ohio State or not. So I went to this university to give my lecture and, uh, and mutually arranged to have lunch with their medieval historian so that we could discuss our mutual interests in demons. <laughs> I have no idea what our server thought. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we talked about our, our interest in demons at some length, and then at the end I said, you know, I also have to ask you because I know you got your PhD at Ohio State, and you tell me about the Department of History there. And bizarrely enough, I've been offered a job in that department. She said, what job is it? And I said, well, I would be this Joe Engel chair. I guess it was what Joe Lynch used to do. She immediately began to cry and said, please take that job. Joe Lynch was so important to me and made such an impression on my life and so forth and so on. And she just said, you would be great. Please do it. Well, this made obviously a big impression on me, you know, this experience. And uh, so maybe I hope I can do half the job that he did. Um, so today, um, we're going to talk about um, Jesus having a wife, which you may have heard about. <laughs> um, part of my life, probably one of its least exciting parts, is that I go to meetings like this, the International Congress of Coptic Studies, which this year met in Rome, which is kind of good, in September 2012. Um, I can, this is a picture I took. There we are at the Augustinian Institute in Vatican City, and uh, we really are a much more diverse group than that, it looks like. There are actually women in the, uh, in the Congress of Public Studies, um, which normally is a fairly quiet uh, event, but uh, late one day at about 7 o'clock, the very last paper of the day was presented. Uh, there were about 15 of us in the room for that paper, and it was on a little piece of papyrus. And the paper was by Karen King, who's a professor at Harvard Divinity School, um, who, and she's holding the papyrus we'll talk about, uh, and she was introducing the group to a little text in Coptic, since this was the International Congress of Coptic Studies, um, which refers to Jesus having a wife, and we'll see what that is like just momentarily, and she called it the Gospel of Jesus' Wife. Uh, so it's very fragmentary, as we'll see, so it's kind of hard to even know what to make of it at first, as, as you will see, but... Anyway, so uh, I, that is a nice title, The Gospel of Jesus' is Wife, but um, I prefer to refer to it as The Gospel of Mrs. Christ. <laughs> so if I refer to that, that's what we're talking about. Um, this, of course, caused a worldwide media sensation, um, including jokes. Barely, I shall be home for supper, says Mary to, uh, says Jesus to Mary, and uh, all sorts of different stuff. But of course, the idea of Jesus being married has been out there in the culture, uh, most obviously the Vinci Code, right? 
right, that Jesus and Mary had some sort of relationship. So there, uh, you know, this seems a little kooky, but uh, we're going to take it somewhat seriously and think about what it could possibly be. So here is the actual um, text. Um, the little fragment, oh, I actually brought with me a little card that's as big as this, but it's only four centimeters by eight centimeters. So, like, very small, okay? Um, and this is the front side. This is what it says. Uh, apparently, Jesus is talking, not to me. My mother gave to me life. The disciples said to Jesus, something. <laughs> Deny. Mary is worthy of it. Something. Jesus said to them, my wife. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> she will be able to be my disciple. Let wicked people swell up. As for me, I dwell with her in order to something. An image. That's it. Now there is a back, but that's all it says. My mother, three, fourth, bitch. And there's not much else. That's the back. Okay. So there's been vigorous scholarly discussion of this, mostly on the internet. And I would say that right now, the scholarly tide is turning towards leaving that this is a modern forgery. That is that the piece of papyrus is probably old uh, because you can buy these on you know eBay. You can buy little pieces of ancient papyrus if you want to. And the fact that it's perfect, nice little four by eight centimeters, isn't that a nice little piece there? That's kind of suspicious in some ways. Um, so there are lots of arguments right now that it is a forgery. Um, we're not sure yet whether this is true. Uh, Professor King is having ink tests be uh, done on it. They're going to test a little bit of the ink to see whether there is there are chemicals in the ink that would not have been available in antiquity. Um, but the other result, so if, if such chemicals are present, that says so much for that. It's a forgery. Uh, but the other possibility is it will just show that no such chemicals are present, but that still does not prove anything because someone who's a forger could that doesn't have telltale chemicals in it, whatever. Um, so we won't go into the reasons why people think it's a forgery, but, um, but what I want to talk about today is why it's not a big deal, even if it's real. Okay, I'm sorry to tell you it's actually not as exciting as you think it might be, but nonetheless. So when I read this, I noticed, um, uh, and how it plugs into my research, what I started to notice is kind of a bundle of things, a reference to Jesus' mother, Jesus having a conversation with disciples um, about Mary, obviously, a reference to Jesus having a wife, a female partner of some kind, uh, and the use of the term image. I immediately thought of a couple passages from an already known early Christian text, which is called the Gospel According to Philip. And let me just show you a couple of these. Um, those of you in the back, this is going to test your ability to see, but I will read it to you. And I've highlighted the stuff that is similar to what we have in our, our little fragment. Uh, so this is the Gospel according to Mary speaking about Jesus, um, Gospel according to Philip speaking about Jesus and Mary. The wisdom who is called barren wisdom is the mother of the angels. And the companion of the something, Mary Magdalene. The something loved her more than all the disciples. And he used to kiss her on her more often than the rest of the disciples. <laughs> they said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered, saying to them, why do I not love you like her? If a blind person and one with sight are both in the darkness, they are not different from one another. When the light comes, then the person with sight will see the light, and the blind person will remain in the darkness. Let's just ponder that and not worry about that right now, okay? <laughs> Three women, this is another passage from the same Gospel according to Philip. Three women always used to walk with the Lord, Mary his mother, his sister, and the Magdalene, who is called his companion. For Mary is the name of his sister and his mother, and it's the name of his partner. So check this out. I mean, we basically have almost all the pieces, right, that's in our little fragment here. Uh, the big thing here is our fragment actually uses the word wife rather than kind of more broad terms like companion or partner, right? This kind of thing. But we have some of some similar things. We also get in the Gospel according to Philip, image. Remember, image was on the last line? So let's look at this. This is a little bit longer, but it's really fun. 
among the shapes of unclean spirits, this is about demons, so this is how I got into this, okay? <laughs> among the shapes of unclean spirits, there are male ones and female ones. It is male spirits that have sexual intercourse with souls who conduct their lives within a female shape, and female ones that mingle promiscuously with those within a male shape. And no one can escape being seized by them, unless by taking on a male or female power, namely one's bridegroom or bride. Now one takes on this power from the imaged bridal chamber. Whenever foolish female spirits see a male sitting by himself, they leap upon him and fondle him and pollute him. So also when foolish male ones see a beautiful woman sitting alone, they seduce her and do violence to her in order to pollute her. But when they see a man and his wife sitting together, the female ones cannot make advances to the male, nor can the male ones make advances to the female. Just so, if the image and the angel join with one another, none can dare to make advances to the male or the female. Okay, don't freak out about this either. We will come back and kind of understand it differently later. So these passages from the Gospel according to Philip call Mary Magdalene, Jesus' partner or companion, they talk about Jesus' relationship with Mary in the context of his relationship with the other disciples, and they depict ordinary marriage as an image of something higher. These are all themes that we've seen hinted at, perhaps, in our little fragment, the Gospel of Mrs. Christ, which takes things a step farther by using the term wife rather than the broader terms of companion or partner. Now, the Gospel according to Philip comes from a very particular school of Christian thought, which we call the Valentinian School, because it's indebted to the thought of the early Christian teacher, Valentinus. In Valentinian theology, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, the unity of and division between male and female were primary metaphors for talking about God, the cosmos, and human salvation. For Valentinian Christians, the pairing of Jesus and Mary Magdalene was a symbol of salvation. I suggest that the Gospel of Mrs. Christ, if it's authentic, should be understood within the context of Valentinian ideas about gender and salvation. And in that case, it probably does not mean to assert that Jesus and Mary were husband and wife in any ordinary sense. So that's the disappointing part of today's topic. So anyway, I'm going to talk mostly then about this school of early Christian thought called the Valentinians. So let me first say a bit about Valentinus, his school, and the evidence I'll be using, since I'm a historian. <laughs> now at least I am. So uh, Valentinus was an important Christian philosopher and teacher who lived from about 100 AD to about 165. He spent the early years of his career in Alexandria and Egypt, but by 140 he was teaching in Rome. Valentinus's work survived only in fragments, but they still give us hints of what an inspiring theologian he must have been. He certainly was a great teacher, for we know the names of many of his students who went on to become significant Christian thinkers in their own right. You see a list of some of those names there. The Valentinians formed a school or tradition in Christian thought that lasted well into the fourth century, when they were declared heretics by the official imperial church. So everything I'm talking about today is a wrap <laughs> Despite their condemnation, a good number of works of Valentinian theology from the second and third centuries survive, and in addition, we have accounts of Valentinian thought from their Christian critics. In this case, I will be making use of three sources, none of which is entirely satisfactory. First, I'll use the description of Valentinian teachings about God found in a massive work by Bishop Irenaeus of Lyon called great title, Detection and Overthrow of Gnosis, that's knowledge, falsely so-called, also known as Against the Heresies. Irenaeus was an enemy of Valentinians, and so he must be used with caution, but his account of Valentinian mythology seems to be confirmed when we have other sources that we can check it against. Second, Clement of Alexandria was also a critic of the Valentinians, but a less hostile one than Irenaeus. He was a little more open-minded. From him, we have a kind of research dossier of extracts and paraphrases from Valentinian theologians, now known as the excerpts from Theodotus, because Theodotus is the Valentinian from whom Clement took most of his notes. Finally, the Gospel according to Philip, which we have already met, is also an anthology of excerpts from Valentinian theological literature. 
but it was compiled by a Valentinian, probably as a notebook for teaching. So you can see that I'm using sources that either are hostile to the Valentinians or that consist of excerpts or fragments, not complete works. So this is my attempt to kind of cobble together a coherent Valentinian understanding of gender and salvation from small bits of evidence, including our little fragment. Other scholars, I will warn you, might put these pieces together differently. But they don't have chairs, so I just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so having said that, let's look at how the Valentinians thought about God in gender terms. There it is. Like many intellectuals of their time, the Valentinians were concerned to account for how all things could originate in a single divine source and yet also be multiple and diverse. They did so by speaking about God as a series of emanations, or what they called eons. The ultimate source of everything they called the Father or the Deep. We'll come back to silence, which you see next to him. The Father is ultimately unknowable and beyond even notions of divinity or thinking. And yet the Father desires to be known. And he does think. And this generates a lower manifestation of divinity called intellect. But here, multiplicity enters the picture. Because intellect has a partner or alter ego or consort called truth. Intellect and truth are both one and two. Their unity and their difference is captured in their genders. Intellect is masculine and truth is feminine. This is because of the grammatical genders of the Greek nouns that name them. Nous for intellect, alethe for truth. Just as male and female constitute two genders and yet make up a single humanity, which can be symbolized in marriage, so too these two eons, intellect and truth, are separate. Intellect is not the same as truth, and yet they are one. There can be no truth without intellect. Intellect and truth, according to the Valentinians, generates a new male-female pair, word and life, which generates yet another such pair, human being and church. These last two pairs emanate another 10 and 12 sets of pairs, respectively. I've not given you all their names. <laughs> the final male-female pair of eons within the Godhead is wished for, male, and wisdom, female. Wisdom is the eon that will generate the material universe in which we live. So all of this is still just the mind of God, so to speak. The greatest value in Valentinian theology and cosmology was harmony and stability. This harmony and stability had a gendered structure. The pairing of complementary male and female elements provided the differentiated structure through which a basic monistic view of how things are, everything comes from one source, the Father, could yet undergird a diverse and variegated cosmos. How do you move from unity to multiplicity without losing unity? The male-female conception provided a kind of grid for that. Male and female are different, and yet they are somehow one. Now, I can't go into the details of all this here, but the harmony and stability we see on this slide was disrupted when wisdom tried to have direct knowledge of the father and apparently disrupted her relationship with her male consort. So you see kind of male-female separation now. This led to the generation of the material world in which we live and ultimately to the sin and death we now experience and from which we require salvation. But before I turn to gender and our salvation, let me return briefly to the top of the slide. According to Irenaeus, some Valentinians taught that even the ultimate father, or the deep, has a female consort, namely silence. 
the feminine name silence would express the ineffability of the ultimate principle, while the masculine names father and deep would express its generative power. It's the source of all life, and yet we can't say anything about it. But Irenaeus tells us that other Valentinians argue that the father exists beyond the categories male and female, and does not have a consort. So male and female appear as categories only at the first derivative level of existence, at intellect and truth. So see the Valentinians disagree about this. And yet, even if these Valentinians argue that the father is beyond all notion of gender, and so has no consort, Father remains, I think we would all agree, an undeniably masculine concept. Here we see a first hint that like most ancient people, Valentinians may have used androgyny as a symbol of wholeness and unity, but androgyny remained asymmetrical. That is, the masculine is the base gender, so to speak, and the feminine is derivative of it. The separation of the female from the male is a loss, but not the loss of an equal partner, rather the loss of the masculine's successful incorporation of the feminine into a masculinity that purports to be beyond gender. Now, a lot of what I just said is pretty ubiquitous, actually, among ancient intellectuals, but there is a specifically biblical basis for how Jews and Christians thought about gender and unity, namely the book of Genesis. As you probably know, Genesis narrates the creation of humanity twice. In chapter one, God creates humanity after making everything else in six days. The story in Genesis one climaxes with this passage. And God said, let's make a human being according to our image. Image. And likeness, and let them rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and the cattle and all the earth and all the reptiles that creep on the earth. And God made the human being, According to God's image, he made it. Male and female, he made them. Let's notice the fluctuation between singular and plural in the ancient Greek text that our Christians would have read. It's kind of ambiguous, isn't it, whether God made multiple human beings who are either male or female, or whether he made a single humanity or human being who is both male and that ambiguity is there in that phrase. But that's chapter one. Then in chapter two of Genesis, creation seems to start all over again. Here God makes the male, Adam, and places him in a garden. But God can find no suitable partner for Adam from among the other animals. And so God performs surgery on Adam. The text reads, and God cast a trance on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and filled the flesh equal to it. And God constructed the rib that he took from Adam into a woman, and he led her to Adam. And Adam said, This now is bone for my bone and flesh for my flesh. She will be called <coughs> woman because she was taken from her man. From here, as you may know, the story goes way downhill. <laughs> the serpent tricks Eve into eating fruit from the forbidden tree. Adam eats as well, and God sends his humanity. Now, how are we to understand this double creation of humanity? Modern biblical scholars have a very simple solution. The editor or editors of Genesis have combined two originally separate creation accounts into one now somewhat confusing story. <laughs> but ancient Jews and Christians did not have access to that hypothesis. Rather, they believed that a single divinely inspired author, Moses, wrote the entire thing. And so they had to make sense of this text as one story. One very widespread, widespread solution among both Jews and Christians was doubtless inspired in part by Plato's Symposium. They would say that Genesis 1, the top story, narrates the creation of a single ideal androgynous human being, and that Genesis 2 tells of the division of this human being into two male and female beings with good and bad effects. The good is that human beings can now enjoy marriage and sexuality, but they also experience sin and death. So Valentinian thinkers, inspired by this, identified the separation of Eve from Adam as the beginning of death. And Christ, they said, came to heal this division. 
in the days when Eve was in Adam, death did not exist. When she was separated from him, death came into existence. If he re-enters and takes it unto himself, death will not exist. Or, in another place, the Valentinian writes, If the female had not separated from the male, she and the male would not die. That being separation became the source of death. Christ came to rectify the separation that has been present since the beginning, and join the two, and to give life unto those who have died by separation, and join them together. So what does this mean if Christ has come to join these two back together? Does each of us have a lost half of the other gender with whom we need to reunite thanks to Christ? The answer is yes, but it's not quite what you might think. It is not the case that each of us is male or female and must reunite with our partner of the opposite gender, for our identities as men and women belong to our bodies, which are not our true selves. They are merely shapes in which we dwell. Our true selves, according to the Valentinians, are our spiritual selves, the parts of us that originated from above. And our true spiritual selves are all female. Mm -hmm. To understand this, we must understand what Genesis is teaching at a higher level. And here is what Clement of Alexandria reports the Valentinians thought that Genesis was really telling us if you understand it deeply. This is kind of complicated, but I'm going to unpack it, so don't worry. The Valentinians say that the passage, in the image of God he created them, male and female he made them, refers to the noblest emission of wisdom, of which the male elements are the election, and the female the calling. And they call the male elements angelic, and the female themselves, that is the Valentinians, the superior seed. Likewise, in the case of Adam, the male element remained in him, but the entire female seed was removed from him and became Eve, from whom derived the female beings, just as the males derived from him. Therefore, the male elements were reunited with the word, but the female elements, when they have been made male, unite with the angels and enter into the fullness. That's why it's said that the woman is changed into a man, and the church that's here into angels. All right, that's very dense. So let's kind of just go through this in steps. When we understand, we, when we understand Genesis, Genesis 127 at a higher level, we learn that it refers not to the creation of male and female human beings, but to two created selves, angelic selves and human selves, which are male and female, respectively. We human beings are all female elements, and right now we exist in a kind of alienation or separation from our higher masculine selves, the angels. We really do each have a guardian angel, our higher masculine self. We are like the divine male-female <laughs> eon pairs, but we are all the female eons, and we are separated from our male consorts. The separation of Eve from Adam represents that alienation on the level of human difference. The original Adam, created in Genesis 1, indicated the original union of the male angels with the female superior seed. And the separation of Eve from Adam in Genesis 2 demonstrated the separation of the female elements from the male, leaving Adam <laughs> simply male. The Genesis account makes clear that the female element is derivative of the male, as Eve was of Adam. The female selves that we have now are the lower derivative aspects of our true masculine angelic selves. So there's, we all have this true self that is in heaven, so to speak, and is an angel. And that accounts for our feeling sometimes of alienation. Who am I really? You know, see, because we actually have this higher self from whom we are separated. Salvation, then, is not simply the reunion of male and female or the coupling of our angelic and spiritual selves. It's rather the return of the derivative female element to the higher male element. 
it's Eve being reincorporated into Adam. And so it's the female being made male. This is how the Valentinians understood a famous saying in the Gospel according to Thomas, which is not Valentinian, but was very popular with Valentin and Valentinus and his students. It's a very famous saying. Simon Peter said to them, Mary should leave us, for females are not worthy of life. Good old Simon Peter. Oh, right on top of this. Jesus said, see, I am going to attract her to make her male, so that she too might become a living spirit that resembles you males. For every female that makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. What the author of the Gospel of Thomas meant by this saying is not clear, and I invite anyone who thinks they know to explain it, but the Valentinians borrowed its language to describe the process of salvation as the female, that's us in our unsaved state, being made male. So here are some examples. These are Valentinians talking about salvation. For as long as we were children of the female only, as though of a shameful coupling, we were incomplete, infantile, unwise, weak, and formless, brought forth like abortions. We were children of the woman, which I think means children of Eve, or just the female. But because we have been given form by the Savior, we have become children of the male and of the bridal chamber. For so long as the seed is still without form, they say, it's a child of a female. But when it is given form, it is changed into a male and becomes a son of the bridegroom. It's no longer weak and subject to the cosmic powers, whether visible or invisible. Rather, having been male, made male, it becomes a male fruit. Now, the important thing to remember here is that we are all females, according to this, right? This is not about women, you know, as opposed to men here, right? We are all the females who must become male. So when Jesus said that Mary must make herself male in the Gospel of Thomas, the Valentinians would not understand this as referring only to Mary, nor as referring only to women. Instead, all of us are Mary, who must become male. The Valentinians understand this process of being made male and reuniting with one's true angelic self as being gradually accomplished through the rituals and practices of the church. Several sources mention a ritual called the bridal chamber, which would enact this reunion. Some scholars believe that bridal chamber is simply an alternative Valentinian term for baptism, while others think that it was a separate special Valentinian ceremony. In any event, salvation will not be complete until the end of this world, when our spiritual elements will unite definitively with our angelic bridegrooms and join the eons of the Godhead as eternal male-female pairs. This is a description of the end of time. Then the spiritual elements, that's us, lay aside their souls. Uh, the soul is the part of us that just kind of makes us walk and talk, so you don't really need a soul in heaven. Okay? So we will lay aside our souls. The spiritual elements lay aside the souls and at the same time as the mother receives the bridegroom, they too receive the bridegrooms, their angels. They enter into the bridal chamber within the boundary, and they come to the vision of the Father, becoming intellectual eons, entering into the intellectual and eternal marriage of the pair. So if the division of Adam and Eve represents on a worldly level division between the male angelic elements and the female spiritual elements, then it is ordinary marriage that provides an image or representation of this final consummation. Marriage, the Valentinians say, is a mystery, something symbolic, which provides an image not simply of our final salvation, but of the underlying male-female organizing principle of the cosmos. Thanks to sin and sexual desire, that image may exist in the midst of pollution, but it does provide such an image. So I think we can now return to our earlier text and understand better what they're saying. Uh, so ordinary marriage is an image of the higher marriage between our lower self, here called an image itself, 
and our angel. So let's return back to the business about the spirits, right? And we're going to now go backwards to the things I saw and looked at at first. So remember, among the shapes of unclean spirits, there are male and ones and female ones. It's male spirits that have sexual intercourse with souls who conduct their lives within a female shape, and female ones that mingle promiscuously with those within a male shape. Notice, again, our true, you know, we, our identities right now as men and women, lies only at, at the level of our bodies, the shape we inhabit, right? But that does determine which evil demons come after us sexually, right? And no one can escape being seized by them unless by taking on a male or female power, namely one's bridegroom or bride. And I think this is just your ordinary spouse that you might marry. Now one takes on this power from the imaged bridal chamber. So I think this imaged bridal chamber is ordinary marriage, which is an image of the higher bridal chamber of reuniting with your angel, right? So whenever foolish female spirits see a male sitting by himself, they leap upon him and fondle him and pollute him. So also when foolish male ones see a beautiful woman sitting alone, they seduce her and do violence to her in order to pollute her. But when they see a man and his wife sitting together, the female ones cannot make advances to the male, nor can the male ones make advances to the female. So married people are safe from these attacking demons, right? But here then is the analogy. Just so. If the image, that's us, the lower person who's made an image of God, and the angel, that's our higher self, join with one another, none can dare to make advances to the male or the female. So see the, the marriage with your angel is an even higher thing than ordinary marriage. And so too, let's think about the relationship between um, Mary and Jesus, they too can be seen as kind of symbolic of the final pairing of the male and the female. So notice in this quote, the wisdom who's called bearing wisdom is the mother of the angels. Notice the reference, you know, the reference to the angels and all of this. And the companion of the, probably of the Lord, or of Jesus, is Mary Magdalene. The Lord apparently loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her on her, we think it's mouth, uh, more often than the rest of the disciples. They said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered, saying to them, why do I love you, not love you like her? If a blind person and one with sight are both in the darkness, they are not different from one another. When the light comes, then the person with sight will seal the light, and the blind person will remain in the darkness. Mary is the kind of paradigmatic disciple. She's kind of the ultimate disciple here in this picture, better than other disciples. So it's her who's pictured as kind of Jesus' companion. But Mary is us. If we, I mean, we too should be the people who are not blind, it turns out, right? And then it goes on to say, three women used to always walk with the Lord. Mary, his mother, his sister, and the Magdalene, who's called his companion. So they had, you know, he's probably making a basic statement here. Yeah, there are these women called Mary hanging out with Jesus during his lifetime. For Mary is the name of his sister and his mother, and it's the name of his partner. Right? So again, I think Mary and Jesus... Mary here kind of functions more as a symbol for all of us who become partners uh, with our um, higher spiritual self. So I think you can see now how Jesus could have a wife and not be married. At least not married in the sense of ordinary marriage. Not getting married and having a dog and all that stuff. <laughs> Rather, Jesus and Mary together represent the ideal self, the saved person restored from division and in harmony with the structure of the cosmos and the very identity of God. The Gospel of Mrs. Christ may indeed be a modern portrait, it's very possible, but even so, the ideas that it probably contained may not be as sensational as the media would like, but they do lead us to one compelling and I think rather profound early Christian vision of gender cosmology and salvation. Thanks for listening. So we have time for some questions, if anyone would like to ask about it. Yes, way about it. Uh, yeah, it's like a basic one. Uh -huh. um, are you suggesting then that, like in the Gospel of Philip, when this all ties together, that Jesus would be kind of like the angel, and Mary Magdalene would represent the, the shape of the angel? That's right. So, um, the, go ahead. No, that was... Right. 
Uh, one of the pieces I left out in the in the uh, desire to not talk forever uh, is that um, the angels, when they are created, uh, are like Jesus' retinue, or his posse, we might say. Uh, irony is says they're his bodyguards in heaven. So when Jesus is uh, emanated, you know, there, there was a lot more emanating going on than was on that slide, right? Uh, when Jesus was emanated, he was emanated with all the angels. So the angels are associated with Jesus, kind of cosmologically. So in a way, what I'm suggesting is that um, uh, just as Jesus is kind of top of the angels, Mary kind of represents kind of them the, the, the best disciple or, or female spiritual element, which we all are, right? So I do think that in the case of Jesus and the angels, there's a qualitative difference between them. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think in this case, they're kind of being seen as forming a continuum. There's Jesus and then there's the angels. Uh-huh. Uh, thank you very much for thank you uh, just a, uh, a very large question, uh, and this relates to the broader context of time. Uh -huh. I have to think that these ideas are not, I mean, for a particular maybe a balance of time, I'm sure, there are certain commonalities with uh, more orthodox Christian thought. As a one of the ones I'm doing, I think I remember the Salve Regina, which yes. talks about the exile of daughters of women, uh, more intriguing in that they did it. Uh, I'm still doing that, and, I'm not doing that and I'm just wondering how, what, what kind of overlaps in terms of relation between the gender forward do we see between the boundary ideas of those of mainstream, as far as the order, and mainstream Christianity? Right, how do these ideas relate to what other mainstream Christians would have thought at the time? Um, a lot of what I said would also apply to mainstream Christians, especially about the interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2 and of thinking of salvation in terms of kind of a reunification. The best example of this is, of course, already in, um, in the letters of Paul in Galatians, uh, where Paul talks of he quotes from um, most likely a baptismal um, saying, something that would have been said at baptism, where he says, in Christ there is no Jew or Greek, there is, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, and then oddly <laughs> changed to, and then there is no longer male and female, not Jew or Greek, slave or free, but male and female, which exactly echoes the Genesis text, right? Um, so it seems pretty clear that even in what we might call mainstream Christian thought, there was already a sense that the division of the genders represented in Genesis 2 is something that would be overcome uh, through baptism. Okay, so that's one idea that you actually find in other streams of Christian thought. Um, obviously, the idea that Jesus has a wife named Mary uh, is very big, actually, in Christianity. But oddly enough, the bride that he normally takes is also his mother. And so what happens in the 300s is that, um, is that Christians, as, as the vocation of being a virgin or a nun really takes off, um, all of these women are talked about as being brides of Christ, right? They have married Jesus instead of some earthly husband, whatever. Um, but then their model, for whom they should model their lives after, turns out to be Mary, the mother of Christ, because she was herself a virgin, right? And by this time, the Mary Magdalene repentant prostitute theme had kind of started to take off by the 300s, which actually is a conflation of Mary with another biblical character who is not Mary Magdalene. So anyway, all of this is to say that, um, and, and of course what eventually happens, especially thanks to the Song of Songs, is the idea that of course all of us are the bride in the Song of Songs and Christ is the bridegroom. And so it, this does take off and it has many overlaps with, with mainstream thought, except it's kind of mythological dimension. And that's where um, mainstream theologians, uh, this idea that there is a female element in God's own identity, which is what the Valentinians are arguing, uh, that's something that most mainstream Christians do not feel comfortable with. Uh-huh, wait in the back and then and then uh, Following up on the uh, very nice that I just talked to you, uh, 
characterization. Line six of this that the women will swell up. Um, is this at all meant to in the analogy uh, be parallel to the wicked demons who come down uh, and, and prey on either the female or on the male, um, and uh, therefore um, the, the, these wicked people are the um, earthly version of these demons, just as Mary would be the wife in that analogy. How do you read that line? Um, I actually read that line less um, demonically, so to speak, and I and I think it probably is referring to people who are critics of the relationship of Jesus and Mary. That is, wicked people let them swell up in the sense of become boastful and arrogant. Okay, um, but and then he says, "But as for me, I'm going to dwell with her, so forth and so on." Uh, what you'll notice, and I I, I could deduce a lot of examples of this from early Christian literature, is that. There's a theme of people challenging Jesus' relationship with Mary and Jesus having to turn aside this kind of criticism. We saw it in, in this one, right, where the disciples go, why do you love her more than us, you know? And we saw in the Gospel of Thomas where Simon Peter says, let Mary be us, females are not worthy of life. And uh, there is a Gospel of Mary uh, that uh, survives in which, uh, once again, Peter uh, really gets lays it to Mary and says, you know, who made you number one apostle, blah, 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 and so forth and so on. And, you know, Matthew comes to Mary's defense saying, Peter, you're so hot-headed. You know, kind of leave her alone. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I think there's a theme in early Christian literature of people criticizing this relationship and in Jesus responding to that. So that's where how I think it is. But as you can see, it's so practical. You know. Yes, Dave. There's, there's pretty obvious similarities between this group of things and the Neoplatonist and what they call That's right. And uh, the emanations and so forth. Right. How many of you in the Christian material world which is so bad with this? Uh, right. Uh, you know, obviously, it's pretty kind of common on the Right, so the, the Valentinians we normally talk about as lying to the period of Middle Platonism, since um, Valentinus and so on would be before Plotinus, right? Plotinus um, in the middle of the third century is usually the beginning of Neoplatonism. But, um, but the Valentinians definitely fall into uh, the category Middle Platonists, as did every Christian thinker who spent any time thinking, <laughs> which I guess is what Christian thinkers would do, right? uh, but any Christian intellectual who started to really think about God and creation ended up thinking in Middle Platonist terms. And all Middle Platonists distinguish between an ultimate God who is unknowable and somewhat kind of remote versus a one or more lower emanations of God that actually does things like create the world and known by us, and so forth and so on. Uh, and as you saw on the Valentinian slide, of course, one of these lower um, uh, items here is word, right? Uh, logos. And so here, like, if you were to contrast this with what a quote-unquote mainstream Christian would believe, they would believe in the Father at the top, and they would totally agree that this Father is unknowable, beyond all thinking, and it's someone we really can't think about or have direct contact with. And they would say, yes, this father then thinks and emanates. What he emanates is the word, a.k.a. his son, a.k.a. the logos, who, of course, becomes incarnate in Christ. And it's this word or logos who actually does the work of creating the world, according to all these early Christian theologians, right? So when God is making things in Genesis 1, it's actually the so they're so yeah they're, they're definitely within kind of these the the uh, spectrum of what we would call Platonizing understandings of God and creation in the second and third centuries. Uh, when did the alternative uh, foundation for uh, diversity and unity in the Trinity arise? Uh, so when did the alternate of the Trinity arise? Um, like the foundation for diversity and unity being trinity rather than the trinity you know, rather than this male female thing. Well, the, the the alternative example I just gave of father and then word and then eventually spirit was developing at exactly this same time, right? Um, what they did not have was um, the critics of the Valentinians who were pushing that. 
uh, but they did not have any kind of female element in their godhead that was not seen as part of it. So they would use euphemisms like womb of the father, stuff like this, right? So the father becomes more rich in his masculinity, so to speak. Um, but um, they believed, I mean, their sense was uh, uh, that the basis of kind of unity and so on really just lies within the father himself. And this idea that, for example, within the cosmos, there should be some principle of unity body, as the male-female principles do, is, I think, for these other Christian thinkers, that's not important. Um, all of it is kind of, we find our entire sense of what holds this cosmos together just in the body. That's sufficient. <clears throat> Maybe one more. Um, before I ask my question, I'd just like to clarify. Uh -huh. When you say the greatest value on the film is harmony and stability, is that one thing? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, if you're harmonious, you're stable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I wanted to ask you, how do you reconcile this um, belief with the other Gnostic tradition of Eve as luminous at the morning? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. And luminous at the morning lays down on the atom, lifts the nail, dark, and strong. That's a contrary. Right. Um, the, the questioner is asking about another a prominent theme in Gnostic mythology in which Eve is kind of an embodiment of a divine female principle that actually enlightens Adam and so on. Um, yes, the, that story you actually find in the myth of the Gnostic school of thought, which is not the same as the Valentinians. Valentinus <laughs> read Gnostic myth and was aware of it and made use of it. And so you find some of those things sometimes in Valentinians, but this is a turn away from that story, right? So so they're aware of that kind of way of seeing Eve, but they probably even self-consciously don't follow it. So great question. So anyway, thank you all very much. And we still have food. <laughs> Thank Professor Brocky and thank each of you for coming. And indeed, as David said, the reception continues. So please feel free to stay and enjoy each other's company over food and drink. Have a nice evening.